absolutely delighted to be here. And uh, my uh, background, I suppose, is Strategic uh, Service Innovation Director for NHS South Central and West. And my passion area is innovation, but fueled what I'd class as by curiosity, using data analytics and applied AI for social good and to reduce health inequalities. My experience over the last few years has been probably uh, predominantly across three planes. And the first plane is what I'd class as kind of sustaining innovations. This is looking for innovations that make your products that you have today better. It creates little growth, but it does move the dial, move the needle. Lots of organizations are focusing in that area. The second one is something which are classed as kind of efficiency innovations. And these are removing what I'd class as unnecessary waste, uh, mundane tasks, big push for automation um, in that discipline. So there's an awful lot the NHS and social care could do to improve in those areas. But one of the other areas, the last area, the third area is disruptive innovation, uh, kind of the sexy area that people want to work in. It's a huge area of growth, digital robotics, AI, Internet of Things and genomics. So big, big areas. We'll hopefully hear more from that. But there's a there's a fourth area that I think is really, really interesting to explore. And that's what I class as big little breakthroughs. These are small everyday innovations, but they drive uh, oversized results. And if you read some of the research that's been on this, Harvard professor Stefan Thom says that 77% of economic growth is attributed to those small creative advances and not necessarily the radical innovation. So it's a kind of a bit of a takeaway for everybody. So yeah, innovation, it is a really tough gig, um, but it's a really exciting place to be in. Uh, for me personally, why am I in that space? I think it's, it covers three key challenges. The first one for me is something called the multimobility challenge. We have a healthcare system today that's built around the management and remains really centered around the management of one disease, of single treatment of single diseases. But we know when patients come up, they have multiple comorbidities. So we need to really look into how we better support clinicians, manage their those patients as well. The second challenge for me again is tackling broader health and well-being needs. I was really surprised to read that the population health and well-being, only 10% of it is linked to access to healthcare. So that's quite shocking when you consider only 7% is, is spent on healthy behaviours. So the other 20% is genetics. The next 20% is your environment the, the sort of a, that you live in. But the 50% you can make what a, a massive impact is healthy behaviours. So there's a whole lot of area there that we can explore and look at. The third one for me really, uh, that really, I'm really passionate about is the ageing workforce. They call it an ageing workforce time bomb. Uh, we've got something like one in five GPs in the UK aged over 55. Uh, and a third of them considering early retirement in the 12, next 12 months. Uh, coupled with the great resignation, we've also got a, a nursing workforce uh, that I think in about five years is, is a huge uh, retirement wave coming along. So those three things for me uh, drive me forward. But I think we've also got some game changing opportunities to leverage digital healthcare technology, such as genomics, digital medicine and artificial intelligence. So hopefully we're going to hear from our speakers today on some of these really exciting areas. Um, I'm, uh, and finally, just to say as well, uh, I think from an innovation perspective, it really does push you personally. It pushes you from a personal growth perspective, especially as we enter what I class as kind of the fourth industrial revolution. Sadly, though, what's going on in Ukraine, I do wonder how we evolve. However, thinking about Ukraine and looking forward today, which is what this is about, I think, you know, the, the call for me is that we need more empowering and more inspiring innovative leaders, uh, what myself and Mark call pirates of the NHS. There's a book I'll refer to and I'll show you later, but we need people that just challenge the status quo and the norm. So if I can kick off first, I'm going to hand over to Andrea Preston, a Macmillan Divisional uh, Pharmacist Lead for Haematology. Uh, she's also an NHS uh, clinical entrepreneur and welcome. Thank you, everybody. It's a real privilege to come and speak against, amongst the great speakers today. I can certainly relate to a lot of what's been talked about this morning, and I hope that my examples um, that I'm going to share with you um, reflect that in real clinical practice. Um, again, this is the first conference I've spoken at in two years, so bear with me if I'm a bit rusty. Um, so I'm going to give a bit of a whistle-stop tour on two research projects um, that I've been working on. So the first is um, using artificial intelligence to enhance patient safety, um, specifically looking at systemic anti-cancer therapy, which I'll relate, um, which I will call SACT as we go through, which encompasses chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and all the sort of oral novel therapies. So just to give a bit of a background, our aims, our progress, and our future plans. And then I'm delighted to talk about an app which just launched at the weekend for us mm -hmm. called MyCML, which is a patient-facing mobile application. 
and just talk through really some of the development challenges we faced um, completing this project in the NHS. So I'll start off with AI and healthcare. Like we all know, this is really booming now um, and the government have made 140 million pounds available over the next year, four years to accelerate the testing and evaluation of technologies, which are most likely to meet the aims set out in the NHS long-term plan. And I think it's really important that as clinicians, we really engage with this um, and try and you know, make the government see where we want it to be used. We, we, we shouldn't shy away from it. Um, and I was inspired, uh, particularly for pharmacy, um, to look at this when I was at a conference, the British Oncology Pharmacy Association conference in 2018, and the debate was about whether AI um, could replace pharmacists. So I obviously went to the BBC as my <laughs> source of information. Um, and I was inspired to look at whether we could use it um, more as a tool, because obviously I don't want to replace this entirely. I'd be the most unpopular pharmacist in history. Um, but if you input your details, um, now, if I was standing here from farmer, I would say to the doctors in the room, you're twice as likely to be replaced um, than us pharmacists and nurses. But as you can see, the likelihood is still very low. So we shouldn't be afraid and think that, you know, AI is going to replace us. We should try and embrace it. So I um, got in touch with the speaker who was um, presenting for in the debate. He was an ex-oncology pharmacist who was doing a PhD in machine learning in Swansea University and asked if he'd be keen to collaborate. And the reason why I pushed this forward actually was a workforce issue. So we are struggling in pharmacy to get more funding for further roles. Um, we know we can improve the quality and safety of patient care, but unless you can prove it's a, a job, um, a cost saving role, it's very difficult to get it implemented at the moment in the NHS because of the financial constraints. Um, we're going up against, you know, nursing posts and nurse, nurse assistant posts, which are obviously, you know, much needed as well, and as well as consultant posts. Um, we're fortunate in the oncology centre, we have set ourselves up as prescribers in a number of clinics like myeloma, urology, breast, but we know that we want to expand into other roles. Um, so really what I was looking at was our work, a majority of the work is looking at clinical verification of SACT, so checking the doctor's prescriptions really. Um, and I wondered if AI could help in that as a tool um, to replace the, I, I thought initially sort of the simpler chemotherapy regimes, but actually I think we should test it to the full. But what I would want to do is look to see if AI can replace some of those roles so we can be released to be more patient facing, speak to patients, help them take their medicines, um, get medication histories correct. And also, what can be looked at is whether a machine can actually be trained to make the best patient outcome decision, which may involve more or different considerations than a pharmacist currently makes, or it might apportion different priorities to those considerations based on the impact on outcome. Um, and so we were successful in getting an above and beyond funding grant in 2019, which is entitled the feasibility study of using cancer related electronic health records with AI to enhance patient medication safety. Um, unfortunately, COVID hit straight after this, so it's been the project's been delayed. But I have to say that one of the best things about COVID when it hit, sorry, that's not quite the right way uh, to say, but um, as Adam uh, flagged earlier on, it really sped up the, um, the clinicians embracing technology and Adam's um, SACT assessment form, which he talked about, is actually key to the success of this project. Because what we are now looking at doing is um, merging data from our electronic prescribing system uh, with our um, Medway patient administration system, which includes the forms that Adam talked about earlier. So the data is, you know, absolutely um, comprehensive. It's just there are some challenges in gathering those two bits together. So just to give a bit of a background, um, I won't go into much detail, but machine learning is a subdomain of artificial intelligence, and this is the type that we'll be exploring. Um, it can computationally extract meaningful insights from complex data structures, um, and it can improve how it performs a task based on past experience so it can learn. Um, I'm not going to go into any detail about this, but just to show that we are going to be using supervised learning. I'm sure there's much more experts in the uh, audience on this than myself. 
So just to recap, the Department of Health requires that all chemo prescriptions should be checked and authorised by a specialist pharmacist who's undergone training because this provides assurance that the treatment is tailored and correct for the patient and their specific disease. And at one point we did a local audit a few years back and 80% of our day case and outpatient treatments which we screened required some form of intervention. But what I want to flag is that some of those are very valid clinical interventions. So you know, recommending to the doctor that they reduce the dose based on the patient's renal function or liver function or based on any other medications that they take because it might interact or other comorbidities. But a lot of the work we do is actually non-clinical and this is where we really want to work to be able to release us to use our clinical skills. So it might be that the weight hadn't been updated, that um, something wasn't prescribed. Um, so what, what we're looking to do is use it as a tool, like I say. So will patients be safe or safer is something we really need to think about. And actually, just to flag, I think it's really important to get patients on board with this. So at the moment, we've just finished our questionnaire that we're about to roll out, asking patients how they feel about AI being used in their care. Um, but what we would um, suggest is that the fours are that machines don't get tired or moody or allow <laughs> emotions to influence their judgment. Um, they can make decisions faster, they can learn more readily, and the algorithms will cut unwanted variation in healthcare. Um, and I'm not so sure on the last point just yet, we're still working this up with them um, uh, in, within the team, but also about keeping up to date with the latest guidelines. But against, a lot of people will say human judgment is considered by some to be a fundamental component of clinical activity with the, that holistic approach to patient care. Um, and if it does provide unsafe advice, because obviously your data is only as good as the person putting the data, you know, the information into the data, um, where will the responsibility lie if there's an error? And there's a huge um, elephant in the room in terms of ethics and, and NHSX are working on that. Um, but all the papers that I've read so far don't really give a strong steer to who would be responsible. I think it's still all being worked up. But I'm sure it'd be great to work with other people to, to learn um, on that. So, but the major um, benefit, which I, was totally outside, to be honest, of my remit when I started, um, is that machine learning can sift through terabytes of data to find patterns and correlations that humans might miss. So actually, by using these big data sets and um, using algorithms, we can actually enable big finds like you might get in cohort studies. So this is really now interesting in our clinicians at, at the Oncology Centre. Um, and we are looking to propose a further research grant we're going to look to to then um, try and explore some research questions. So I, I think the challenges for us are the accuracy of the data, obviously, um, access and data, which is what we've been working on for the past year, been working with the business intelligence unit um, to extract the data from Medway and from ChemoCare. Um, we're still working on that. It's not easy. Um, and everybody's really busy as well as clinicians on the ground. Um, there's been a significant amount of input from our information governance team. And we've been speaking with the universities about security across the boundaries because we're trans it is anonymized um, data. Um, and then also, as I said about the ethics of AI in healthcare, and I'm really excited to be launching this patient surveys. It's not really that pharmacy related, it's more around AI and talks about, you know, different shopping websites and, you know, just showing pe pe people really that actually AI is already out there and we just may not know that it's being used for our data. And just to show about the collaboration, which people have spoke a lot about earlier today, um, the project team literally started with just myself in the UHBW and Bruce in the academic box, but it has grown exponentially and it's a really exciting time for me. I'm working with people I've never worked with in the trust. The business unit, um, they've been out really supportive. The IT department, um, information governance, the patient and public involvement team. Um, in the academic section, so Professor Zhu is the brains behind all of this. Um, he's fantastic, but I do need Bruce to interpret between myself and <laughs> Professor Zhu. Um, so, and then Luke McGuire is a psychologist um, at the University of Exeter who is helping us. Um, and recently, only in the last few weeks, we've got Cameron Fenwick from the University of Bristol, um, who's now looking at the intellectual property side of it. So again, another huge thing I hadn't really thought about. 
Um, and for all of this, we needed the support of Adam, obviously, initially, um, as our CCIO. So Adam's been on board from the beginning um, and just making sure all the key people really are supportive of this. Um, and as we go through, I'm sure there'll be more people being added to this. And the brilliant news, this was such a pinnacle for me, um, is that we had a PhD studentship then um, in uh, University of Plymouth. So we've appointed um, a fantastic student, um, Shui, who's from China and has now relocated to Plymouth to work on this with us. So um, I'm now a clinical supervisor on a PhD. So again, you know, just really um, exciting. <clears throat> So that's the AI park. That's obviously very much an early stage uh, project. Um, and yeah, very happy to talk about. There's been a lot of challenges, which I haven't really talked about in that section. But for the MyCML, I'd like to focus on some of the challenges that we've had. But um, so MyCML is a um, patient empowering app that I've developed um, collaboratively. Um, basically, it started as a, a project with um, Nick Duncan, who's a consultant haematology pharmacist in Birmingham. Um, and we try to do it as just within the NHS. But as Adam says, you know, our IT departments are really, really stretched and didn't have the manpower really to help us with this. So I'll just show you. Um, oh, sorry, this is just a slide to show why did I choose CML? Um, and basically, we do know that um, adherence in CML can have a really significant impact on um, patient outcomes and response rates. There's not many adherence studies just inherently because they do introduce bias. But um, this is a, an older paper. But as you can see, that the 26 percent of patients who are on imatinib um, who had adherence rates late, um, lower than 90%. The probability of, of achieving an MMR, which is a major molecular remission, was 28% versus 95%. Um, and the probability of losing a complete cytogenetic response was 36% versus 1.4. So this is a really, you know, it's really important that patients do take their medications for um, CML. And then this was just another study to show that obviously there's cost implications on that. If patients aren't taking their medicines properly, um, you know, they aren't going to get the right outcomes um, and, you know, there's a waste, uh, medicines wastage there. So I think this shows the um, <laughs> the need for perseverance. Um, this is the app timeline from um, when we wanted to do it to when it launched. And as you can see, that's from 2016. So that's been six years. Um, so just to take you through it, at the beginning, I actually was looking to do it for CML and ALL. So ALL, CML is generally a, a disease in the el more elderly population, but ALL in the younger patients. And at that time, we, we were starting to draft a grant application to look at um, the feasibility, but we were looking at using existing adherence apps. Um, that failed, to be honest, there were a lot of barriers. Um, and then in um, 2018, treatment free remission came in. So this is really exciting in CML where you can stop a patient's therapy and they maintain that deep molecular remission. So that's obviously brings a lot, lot of benefits for patients and for funding in the NHS. And actually as clinicians, a lot of the time you're really focused on the grade three, four adverse events, but actually patients who've got those rumbling grade one and two adverse events actually plan treatment holidays as they call them and don't take their medicines. So really trying to optimize adherence is really important. So we changed our plan and we really targeted the CML patient population, also supported by a European study which showed that, you know, you shouldn't discount um, older people in wanting to use smartphone mobile applications. OK, <laughs> I'm short on time, so I'm going to whistle stuff through. Basically, we then presented at the NCRI CML working party. We got on board um, a university student to do a survey. It was 280 patients. Um, and that actually has been the biggest driver to be able to be successful in this because they were on board from the beginning. That really supported us to get a medical educational grant with services from Pfizer. And then um, with that, we could then outsource to an app developer who's Sam Spurgeon from the uh, tech company. And from then on, it was just the timeline just sped up in, in significant, you know, very significantly. Um, I'm really pleased to say that we launched on Google Play and Apple uh, just at the weekend. And in five days, we've had nearly 300 downloads as far as New Zealand. So we've had New Zealand, Australia, America, and now even Japan and Thailand, which is causing a few problems with the calendars. Um, but yeah, so that's great. So this was the, uh, the survey, which then led us to have the evidence to show to Pfizer. Um, 
just to say initially another challenge was I really wanted all the different TKI pharma companies to work on this app with us but that is impossible that took another few months to work out and then Pfizer had this what we could um, uh, apply for this grant I won't get into the app um, specifically but this is the patient feedback post launch this is literally in the last five days um, as you can see somebody in New Zealand asked about a drug interaction and then somebody replied that hey I've just downloaded the MyCML app and you can type in your TKI and then it'll tell you um, and then everybody's sort of saying that's great and thanks so we're working with the charities to promote it all the leukemia charities and um, I'm hoping to get to BSH um, to advertise it so um, yeah just in terms of challenges um, it was securing the initial funding API agreements I've had a massively steep learning curve around contracts end user license agreements privacy policies um, information governance um, the Android medication minds is more technical that our app developer could tell you about. Also, we had a real issue right at the end with the Apple developer account. Um, we launched on Google Play immediately with our tech company, but for Apple, they rejected us um, three times. The first was because our Apple developer account wasn't a healthcare one. So we had to go back to the trust and our trust team who were, you know, as we say, really busy. They've been brilliant and managed to get a new account at, at the trust because we'd only had... Um, staff facing apps before so this is the first ever patient facing app that our trust has launched which you know i'm thrilled with and so the, for the future we need to communicate it um like lorraine said we're really tight for time um nick and i didn't get any funding to do the work for this um so we've done it all in our own time what we've done going forward is made sure we've got a research award now so that we can evaluate the app post launch because obviously again as what's been said this morning is the maintenance that's really important we want to keep developing it um, we're about to have an ORCA review, which is a DTAC assessment. Um, and then, yeah, we need to then secure our further funding. Um, so sorry, I know I'm over time, <laughs> uh, but thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Andrea, thank you. That's that's wonderful. And I, I feel a bit bad now. I was just speaking to her earlier before her presentation saying that it's taken me two years to get something to market. I think you were saying that's taken six, but no, fantastic. Hi, right, so my presentation actually carries on from what Grant uh, Valance was talking about this morning. So I'm really big in the uh, kind of open source space uh, and social coding is kind of what the cool kids do now. So I'm going to try and, try and explain it to you um, and how we kind of promote open source in the NHS, NHSX and NHS England in particular uh, and through the NHS Python community. So uh, like Mark and John and myself are all on the Python community board. Uh, and I work as a data engineer in the NHS, and so we handle quite a lot of complex software development projects, um, and they're very difficult to uh, handle, not just from a technical point of view, but also from a kind of communications um, and um, is everything okay? Yeah. Uh, from a technical point of view, and from also kind of like a project management setup. Um, so like I was just going to explain if this sounds familiar to you and then you can kind of uh, join in with me. So I, I typically work in a very large kind of bureaucratic organization that's often hampered by what we call silos of expertise. And it's kind of what grants would talk about this morning. And also we have many different development teams, but most of those engineers can't even see other engineers code across teams. So it's very difficult to kind of collaborate even just within the organizations that we're part of. Um, often, um, I work in very large teams, but you end up in a situation where there's only actually one engineer per team or one or two software developers. So you, you very often don't have anyone to kind of bounce ideas off and you're effectively working on your own for most of your career. Um, you don't have that kind of like collaboration on a personal level, especially in the last two years when we've all been working remotely. Uh, you don't sit next to people, you don't have those kind of water cooler conversations and so on. Uh, and then a lot of these projects where managing them through kind of writing long email chains, I'm sure you're all familiar with this kind of problem. Uh, and the issue with that is that the, the software development projects are very complex and the English language just kind of lacks the specificity to talk about the issues that we're having with the code. And so just, you know, it's going, going back and forth uh, on email chains, trying to understand what we're asking each other uh, and so often we resort to kind of having big teams calls and having to organize that and have five different engineers kind of 
all talk to each other. Uh, and these are kind of the difficulties that we typically have um, in the NHS with developing software. And so now, now as a senior engineer, I'm, I'm particularly concerned about how we manage the development of software like within NHS England and, and also across the NHS as a total. And hopefully social coding is kind of one way of doing that. It's kind of a piece of software, but also a kind of way of working that we can develop. Uh, could you just have the next slide, please? John? So I can't really talk about social coding without talking about GitHub because this is the tool that we use. Um, and like it says here, it's where the world builds software, which is kind of a bold claim, but actually fairly accurate these days. Uh, it's become kind of indispensable to how uh, software developers build code. And if you don't know anything about it, essentially it's a version control system. So it's kind of like where we store our code. But it's also a website and it has many different social layers that I'm not sure many people are actually aware of. So it's not just code, it's conversations, it's project management, um, it's all kinds of things. And I'll try and explain a bit about it. Uh, and this, this might sound a bit like a sales pitch, but I'm genuinely not employed by Microsoft. Um, but it's, um, it is something that's come along and every, every so often, you know, a piece of software is truly transformational and actually adds a lot of value. Um, so it, yeah, the, the cost, it is genuinely free for it to a certain level. We do pay for the kind of pro version at NHSX and NHS England because there's kind of additional security features. Um, but essentially it, it can be free if you're just using it. So like the NHS Python community uses the free version. And recently in the draft kind of open source policy at NHS England, which is uh, looking for feedback, uh, GitHub has become the recommended version control system for the NHS. So this is kind of like where things are going, hopefully, in the future. Um, and so, yeah, it has become indispensable. And the real value that I, I want to kind of get across is not so much in the technical side of it. It, it is a very technical tool. But it's in the kind of project management side where you can bring that kind of agile project management, the, the Kanban boards, all that kind of thing, but also communication so like you can talk to people you can have threaded communications you can have forums and so on but it's connected right next to the code so as you're developing the code you can kind of point directly to specific pieces of code and ask people you know questions submit your own code uh, make improvements you can use code that other people have already developed which i do quite a lot i'll, I'll go into that later uh, and use it for your own purposes and you know i've i've derived much value from this by kind of taking things from NHS Digital, uh, other colleagues, NHSX and so on, and building my own tools completely for free. Uh, and there are other features of it as well. Uh, and so even if you're not doing it publicly, so you can make your code completely public, but naturally in the NHS, that's not always completely appropriate, uh, depending on the, the technology that we're talking about and the data and, and so on. You can make it transparent across the organization. So like at NHS England, being able to uh, yeah, being able to kind of like show other teams your code and being able to learn from other teams is actually quite important as well. Um, and it's also a way of kind of like managing uh, information, storing documentation, also capturing the decisions that have been made. So, for example, one of the big issues that we have is pe people move on and pe new people join our teams. And getting up to speed of like where we are in this project can be very difficult if you don't have like a history of what we've actually done all the way up, up to this point. Capturing that in kind of like a Word document or something is just really not appropriate with code because it's difficult to even capture code kind of in, in Word documents and so on. So um, <clears throat> yeah, if you could just go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like. It's not. Uh, I'll, I'll not really go through it, but essentially it's, it is a website as well as being a, a piece of software. And so if you do make your code public, this is where you can kind of show off your code and uh, share it with other people and you can browse uh, across all different code. So the next slide as well. Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, so like the big uh, value for social coding is through collaboration. So like on GitHub, you can look at other people's code. You can collaborate with your team. They can kind of submit code to you. And like as a senior developer, I can then review people's code, make um, kind of comments and co contributions and so on. So like, how, is, is this actually what we want to do? Um, right within the code, it's difficult to explain kind of on a slide, but when you're actually developing code itself, 
is really important. Uh, you can also kind of fork code as well. So I, I use this quite a lot. I forked a lot of code from NHS Digital and NHSX and then built my own tools and then shared those back with the community. So in terms of like spreading best practice um, and kind of how things should, should be done across the NHS, this is an incredibly important tool. Uh, so for example, just one of the most important tools that we've got is the digital service manual from NHS Digital, which is kind of like a, a way of developing websites with all the accessibility features that they've spent an awful lot of time developing um, that should be part of like every website that the NHS uh, develops. That's all available completely for free on GitHub and you can use it to build your own websites. And I, I do know some of the smaller NHS organisations are still paying private companies to develop you know, their, their own website for their own organisation where they could really be doing it for free if they had someone with some small skills and it really doesn't take much. I, I'm not a web developer, but I've managed to develop websites using this technology. Um, you can also then, so for example, you, you can contribute to other um, projects. So I've, I've contributed to quite a lot of different projects across the NHS and it helps improve kind of like their code, make spotting problems becomes a lot easier. Um, so, uh, sorry, next, next slide as well. Thank you, John. Yeah, so you can have conversations as well. So this is kind of the important part of it where it's not just about the code itself, it's about how to communicate with different teams. And we've had quite a lot of kind of spontaneous collaboration across the NHS where people have found what we're doing, we've been advertising it and kind of asking people to kind of um, come and fix their problems. Um, the the bug, like bugs in your code often get fixed faster if there's an open code base uh, because it's easier or more, you know, like the more people you have looking at it, the more easier it is to find. There's a kind of famous, Linus quote that with enough eyes on a problem, the solution is obvious. And um, so if you have enough developers looking at a particular problem, it should be quite easy to find. Um, there's also kind of a, a, a question where if you know that you're going to be publishing your code publicly, you probably take more care in developing it in the first place um, because you kind of security first in that kind of sense. Uh, so there is a kind of argument that publishing code uh, publicly makes you more conscious about best practices, but also kind of security, because naturally you don't want to be releasing kind of uh, security keys in your code and, and configuration files and things like that. So it, it has been a big deal that we've been talking about NHSX, about how as a, senior, like as a data engineer, we're often working very closely with the data. And naturally, that's a, like the security implications are, are quite serious. So we do have to think very carefully about how we make our code open, but make the this, the data secure on the back end. So there's a lot of there's a lot of talk that we've been going up around that. Um, so next slide, John. Yeah. So as well, this is kind of like the the nice part of it that once you've developed those tools and technologies, GitHub makes it very easy to publish your work. So you can actually host kind of little websites. Uh, on GitHub and it makes it very easy. There are certain situations where you want to go through the corporate comms channels uh, for like you know big projects, but they often tell us that we shouldn't be pushing um, technical information through the corporate comms. So we have lots of different websites uh, that we've developed like documentation about our project. That's kind of a primary source of um, what GitHub does. But also you can build these little kind of IO websites as they're called where you know, the Python community has its own website built entirely on GitHub. It's entirely free. We don't pay anything. I, I built it in a weekend, so it's it's very simple. Um, you can go even further as well. So I did another project where I collect statistics about open source projects um, in the NHS. So like how many open source projects are there? How often are they updated? How many kind of issues are raised on those projects and all that kind of stuff? Um, and so I do that entirely just through a little bit of Python code on GitHub and it commits the data back to the repository uh, just through the GitHub API. And so it's very, very light. It's, you know, it cost, not, cost me nothing to do and it's been running automatically for the last few years and I've never had to touch it and it just updates every day with, you know, any new kind of code that's been developed. Uh, and so you can kind of develop quite a lot of stuff like that. And I've built templates that people can use to build their own kind of tools and quite a lot of people have gone on to use that. So 
it kind of it's kind of like a force multiplier where you know you build one thing that gives people ideas to build other things and it just goes on and on and on uh sorry last last slide please so the other part of this which i want to talk about particularly is like the career development aspect of it um you can see like a lot of people have lots of technical skills in the nhs but if you've been working on your own in a kind of siloed situation it's very difficult to kind of understand what you've actually done just saying that i'm a python programmer is not very informative whereas i've been particularly working with a lot of my apprentices and technical uh, trainees um, to make sure that they evidence what they've been able to do and so you can build up a profile on github itself with all the different kind of open source repositories and projects that you've been working on and you can actually see that you know like oh these people actually know what they're doing uh, and some of my apprentices have gone on to have really good careers in the NHS, so it's clearly been working. I don't think this has quite uh, worked its way down to the actual kind of uh, job uh, interview level yet, but I, I kind of see hopefully this is like kind of where things are going in the future, where you can actually evidence what you're doing. Uh, and for, my, for myself, you know, I, I made, made sure to put all of the documentation and kind of thinking and research that I'd done uh, at my time at NHSX, and that did definitely help me get a job, uh, you know, the next one at NHS England. Uh, just it, mainly in, just in terms of like the confidence of being able to speak to the projects that you've done. Um, it's not just simply um, saying, you know, I'm a good Python programmer, that's very difficult to evidence. Um, I guess my take home message would be, you know, I think the NHS needs to move away from being an organisation that buys software uh, and move to an organisation that develops software. I think that's the next kind of big step, um, like transformation of the NHS. And hopefully these kind of tools will kind of bring us towards that, especially from the management side of things, uh, bring, bring the management and the developers closer together and as well across the NHS. So this is things that we've been working on in the Python community. Uh, is there any questions? Thank you, Craig. Some great insights onto the power of uh, social collaboration. We're going to take questions at the end of the sessions. I'm going to introduce uh, Mark uh, Bailey, uh, who's going to talk uh, about. So, Mark is basically a specialty doctor in respiratory medicine and is a clinician who codes for Gloucestershire Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust. And Mark is going to be presenting Cancer Pathways 2.0. So, I'm going to hand over to Mark. I'm going to be talking to you about uh, some work that me and my two computer science students have been working on, on trying to digitize and automate the lung cancer pathway for Gloucestershire. Um, there's lots to it. There's building the, the damn thing, and there's also trying to get it implemented and accepted within Gloucestershire as well. I won't talk about the latter too much, but I want to talk to you about the problems that we had with, have with the lung cancer pathway and how we think we can try and solve them. So I'm going to be talking about numbers, ideas and solutions. So just a bit of a background about myself. I am a specialist doctor in respiratory medicine, a sleep specialist, help run the sleep service. I started in 2017, 2018, I thought there's lots of repetitive work here. I'm just going to automate stuff because I know about digital from my, as a hobby, I, I do digital, I automate the house and so on. My wife's run off um, to tell you how annoying that can be, but anyway, <laughs> I think she's listening remotely now. And I built a Microsoft Access database in 2010, Microsoft Access, which helped run the whole sleep service and still does. And it also helps with the bronchiectasis service and the tuberculosis service. We call it Spiritum, which is Latin for breathe. We thought it was appropriate for a respiratory department. Um, we did a QI, so quality improvement project on this, uh, over looking, uh, looking at the, da um, the database, Microsoft Access database, the desktop app, also other uh, logistical changes to the service. And we found we brought down breaches by 79% over two years. A spin off from the work with the database, the desktop app, was a program called Quick Spiritum. And going on the open sourcing that Craig was talking about, Quicksperson is built in an open source um, scripting language um, and it's robotic, robotic process automation is quite a bit of a buzzword in the NHS at the moment. 
but just automates stuff you do as a clinician every day, looking up x-rays, bloods, letters, sending off the press and so on. Saves 30% of clinicians' time when we did a QI on that as well. And from all of this, we started thinking, well, we've learned all this automation stuff. You know, can we use it in other ways? So just backtrack a bit. I, when I automated or helped to streamline the sleep service um, with the, the lung physiologist and the rest of the respiratory team, I, we're looking, there's, I was looking at how many steps there were. To get a patient from referral, oh, they, they come up to their GP and say, I'm really tired. And they go, well, you might sleep apnea, let's refer you on. So they have a sleep study and they have a, and that shows that it's positive or negative. They see, get seen in clinic and then they start sleep apnea. Nine steps from start to finish. Not too bad. Now, this is lung cancer. I know there's not 34 to 87 boxes up there, but that bigger box, if I can use the mouse to highlight it, the bigger box here is all the investigations you can have for a patient with lung cancer. Let me expand that. These are all the things that you can ask for for a patient. You can get x-rays, um, camera tests down into the lungs, lung function tests, look at the heart functionality, refer for smoking cessation, all these things. And each one of these things has three or four different steps. You request it, a letter gets sent out to the patient, they need to arrive um, or have a phone conversation, then someone writes back with you the results. So that just each of these things adds three or four extra steps and you add them up, you get up to 87. And then you can refer on to the surgeons, oncologists, palliative care and so on. Lots of things going on. So since Andy spoke, there's actually another system added. So he said there's 13 systems. I've added another one, just for giggles. Um, the MDT booking app is also there. So there's 14 systems, 14 different systems. Don't say digital systems because paper's up there on the top, right? But there's 14 different systems that we have to interact with. Clinicians, admin staff, patients not so much. But 14 different systems. Wouldn't it be nice if it was just one system? at least one or two, at least half even, whatever. Can we improve things? And that's what we've been trying to do, thinking it through, how can we improve things? How can we make a better system? I can't remember how many Andy said, I think I've had another um, person. Yeah, so it's 15 people involved in getting a patient from start to finish, from A to B, from referral to treatment for lung cancer. For sleep, let's just compare and contrast. I think there's three or four. There's a GP, some admin people, the patient themselves, lung physiologists, boom. So all these people need to communicate as well. And like I said, there's the patient as well. Let's cut off the top of it. This is where everyone tilts their head to the left to try and be what I've got as a title. But this is a list of essential <coughs> things that I thought, why can't we automate it? Why can't we make the computer do these things that are very simple, shall we say, for a computer to do. There's no, not too much thinking processing. There's no AI for these things. Basically sending off requests, getting data back, recording MDT discussions, stuff like this. That's when we started building Spirit and Duo. I put generic app at the top, but Spirit and Duo is the next logical name. We had Spirit and for the Access Database, Quick Spirit and for the RPA, Spirit and Duo, Breathe to in Latin. And this is a wireframe. So this is a quick drawing we've done on it. There is a nice, very pretty app and very functional app, demo app that we can show you out near the posters later. But login page, as you would expect, and then a to-do list. These are things you need to do. You've got these patients, these are all fake patients, then you're triaging, there's a pet CT to look at, you click on that hyperlink there, it takes you to the next page. Actually, I'll click this page, and I know there's lots going on here. Maybe we can simplify this, but this is an idea where you have every bit of information you will need to make a decision in one place. And there's a nice graphical representation of pathways we call it at the top, the, um, uh, the bar at the top, which shows you how far along that patient is. So 58 days along their pathway, and it can show you what's happened at different points in their pathway. And then you can choose all those requests that we need at the bottom and it'd be sent off all in one place and we need to communicate so why not have whatsapp built in 
and all those messages, which would normally at the moment be done by email, and they can get lost, get deleted, and you, fix, you try and remember that you need to look at that email later and you, you can't find it. It's all emails, or sorry, all messaging for that patient is kept in, for that patient in one place, and you can always go back and refer to it later. You've got an audit trail. And then why not start thinking of Internet of Things, thinking about um, getting your smartphone involved, and actually that PET CT scan, so that's a scan looking for active nodes in the body. You want to know when it's back because that helps progress the pathway quicker next and you can save hours to days. If you find out on your phone, oh, this needs to be looked at, I'll find some time today to go and sit down and look at those images and figure out what I can do next. Whether we have you able to actually outcome that on your phone or not, that's to be decided. That's what the conversations are going to be about around this. And what was this? Oh, yes, patient information videos. This is an amazing idea, I think, where let's say a patient has a, a PET CT booked or any scan booked, and the patient doesn't know what this is. Why not have a video to tell them all about it? A video that actually takes them on a virtual walkthrough of the hospital, through to the reception, through to the corridor, through to the scanner made specifically for our trust or whatever trust there was going to be some things that you don't need to have the walkthrough for but why not you know some of the anxiety involved involved with you know having a scan having biopsy why not have videos showing them where they're going to be what it's about meet the staff beforehand and have that sort of message to the patient when you ask for let's say a pet ct on this page it automatically sends an sms or an email to a patient with that link to a video that takes them through the whole thing now, I did mention this um, earlier, the graphical representation of pathway. Um, and what is this? This what this is trying to show. If all the patients, so that normally there's about 40 or 60 active patients on, on a, uh, at the time in lung cancer. And what this is trying to show is, oh, which patient is about to breach. And then we have a, um, a breach, uh, a recommended um, referral to treatment time of 62 days. And we try and get patients within that window, even shorter as possible, because faster diagnosis, faster treatment is better prognosis. There's lots of good evidence about that. And this is this graphical representation of the pathway is trying to show you where patients are, what's happening, what's outstanding. And let me take you through an example patient broken down over time. So from day 10 to day 100. So um, the blue is when there's a clinician and the, the colors can be decided but the blue is when it, there's a, a decision that's waiting for a clinician to get um do input uh orange is when you're just waiting for a request to come back and green something is done so you can see for day 10 you're waiting for an opa an outpatient appointment to happen there's nothing you can do from the clinical side you're just waiting for that appointment to happen day 20 pets happen um waiting to happen and day 30 so on so on so on and you can see Let's go down to day 55, day 62. Those blue bars are getting bigger and bigger. And that's the blue bars is where we're waiting for clinicians to make um, a decision. And this is good for audit. You can see, oh, there was this really long wait. And oh, it happens for most patients. What's that bottleneck? How can we improve it? And it's all graphically shown. So potential benefits of this new pathway. It's not built yet. There's a demo we have, but it's not built into the trust. It's not working, um, functioning app yet, but we're designing it. We've got lots of ideas what to do for it, how to progress with it. But the idea behind Spirit and Duo, or an idea of it built into the EPR or whatever, but what at the moment we're doing is basically a proof of concept, is that we want to speed up the pathways for better prognosis for the patients, better experience for the patient, tailored made um, with pe patient um, tailor made uh, information videos, reduce staff workload, which <laughs> all of us are suffering from, and improve staff experience of managing lung cancer pathways by using user centered design approach. Now we're doing it for lung cancer now, because I am a shrewdity doctor, I understand lung cancer, I understand all the bits and bobs around that. I'm not a lung cancer specialist, but I do understand that disease and I'm around people that do and I can ask questions from. We're building this spirit and do it in a modular fashion. So other diseases, not even just cancers, other diseases could use it. Maybe that's a very you know, big ambition, but I think it's worth a go. Because like I said earlier, 
we're all trying to save, um, solve the same problem. Why not make it universal? So go and try it out. Take your, take your smartphone, take your tablet, take your, your computer and go and see Nick and Joe at their post a bit later. They will give you the details how to log in and let you play with some fake patient data and see how it works to take a patient from a referral right all the way through the pathway to actually, you know, getting down to treatment. You get five patients to try out on each of you. See how successful you are. I'd love to have a scoring system, see who's the quickest to get everyone through. But anyway, go and try it out, please do. Nick and Joe would be very happy to show it. We've been working really hard to get it to look really good. So the wireframes I showed you um, before with the white backgrounds, that was the idea. We now have the demo that looks very nice, I would say. And please give us your feedback. So me, Nick and Joe and Grant Valance have been working really hard on building this demo, but we need more people to tell us actually that functionality would be better, or this way of doing things would be better, or this look at something, or so and so and so on. Please give us honest feedback, honestly. We want this to work for everyone. Now, go and ask Nick and Joe why does Duplo mirror clinical pathways? And I'll leave you with that. Now, many thanks for Swag for actually giving us the money for um, Nick and Joe, for giving us the opportunity to actually work on this. NHS X, who are now NHS Digital, and Innovation Lab, who's got involved with us as well, and Grant, who's actually been really, really helpful and helping us just improve and make this demo that we have work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. And uh, yep, so next presenter, I'm going to welcome Sally Plum uh, to the session, Senior Program Manager. Sally's going to be presenting Digital Community Health, Virtual Wards and Tech Enabled Remote Management part of the national direction with southwest activity so i'm going to hand over to you sally thank you thank you um so thank you very much it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you today um i will say that i'm just standing i'm sta standing in for paul hebden rather belatedly and i'm using somebody else's slides so i'm going to ask you all to be very kind to me um, what I want to do, this, this is an absolutely massive subject, so what I want to do is just um, give you a brief overview and hopefully whet your appetite a little bit. So I want to just talk about virtual wards and tech-enabled remote management and just a little bit, a bit of um, information about the national direction and what's happening within the southwest. So if we just look at the definition very quickly, um, when we're talking about virtual wards, we're actually talking about um, something which is used to support patients who would otherwise be in an NHS hospital bed. Um, and that can be at either end of the pathway, so it can be to prevent avoidable admission or to support early discharge. And as such, we really need to still be thinking about managing length of stay by establishing criteria to reside and uh, criteria to admit. Um, please just let me know if these aren't moving at all. Um, I'm, I'm going to assume that they are. Um, so when we look at the world of virtual health or the world of, of remote monitoring, um, we need to think about virtual care as um, enhanced healthcare at home. That isn't an alternative to, to hospital, but it does need to wrap around the virtual ward model to actually allow the monitoring of people who might deteriorate, who may need admission to the virtual ward, who may need step down or safety netting out in the community, um, and for monitoring and managing long-term conditions or chronic disease. Um, the tech enablement or remote monitoring bit can obviously run the whole, the whole pathway, the whole continuum of their care, from population health through to end of life care. And it may actually be the same tech, but what changes is the level of interaction, the workforce model, and who the patient interacts with. So you may move from a primary care for long-term condition management but acute or community care colleagues for a virtual ward. From a digital point of view, what this does show is that there really needs to be a joined up local digital strategy at system level, and it probably isn't something that you can do in isolation. 
So where are we at the moment? So this is the national picture. So this was a return done in December where there were at least 53 virtual wards supporting around, around 2,400 patients. It's moved on fairly significantly since then. Um, and we've also obviously seen these were conditions beyond COVID-19, but we've obviously um, seen a massive um, rapid expansion of the COVID virtual wards from de December 21 onwards. I have no idea why this slide is such a lurid colour blue, and I do apologise. Um, this is just an update from Paul, really, as to where we are in terms of um, the southwest position. So we've got uh, those wards, virtual wards that are operational within the southwest, those that are planned. And there's also a list of tech enabled remote services which are operational within the southwest. And that was with scaling up um, money that came down from NHS X. So in terms of the ambition for 22-23, and I would state it is an ambition, ICS has been asked to develop comprehensive multi-year plans to develop virtual ward capacity equivalent to 40 to 50 virtual ward beds per 100,000 population. Um, and uh, part of the ambition is to fully exploit remote monitoring technology and wider digital platforms to deliver effective and efficient care. Again, I realise there's, there's quite a lot of information here um, and it is a long slide set. You, you will be welcome to have it. It's got lots of links and lots of um, contacts within it. These are nine principles um, upon which virtual wards should be built. For the purpose of this talk, I just want to go down to digital inclusion. Um, and, and by that, I mean that we need to consider the risk of excluding patients by the exclusive use of digital tools. Um, but I would caveat that with a little bit of caution, because I think we really need to be aware of our own bias in assuming that there are certain groups that aren't going to be able to partake or learn the requisite skills. And I think feedback from some of the early adopters of remote monitoring have shown that most people actually manage very well. And sometimes it's our own or our staff's misgivings about tech. And so actually building that digital confidence in workforce is really, really important. So what does a what does a uh, what does good look like? What what does a virtual ward enabled by technology actually look like? There is a video embedded in this, um, a few slides down, which is worth having a look at. It certainly speaks to it much better than the way that I'm now going to describe it. Um, but generally, it would look uh, a tech enabled uh, model would look like something which it manages patients by a digital platform, uh, managed remotely by a clinical team. In this model, patients generally wear a device that continuously uh, monitors their vital signs or measurements, or it's taken at agreed intervals. The data is entered into an app or a website where clinical teams can review the information via a dashboard. The technology ensures that clinical teams are alerted when the patient moves outside the agreed parameters, or really importantly as well, if they miss a reading, and it allows them to actually take the appropriate action. In terms of some of the support that the national team has produced, there is there's a raft of, of um, guidance and resource tools uh, within here. You'll see there's you know there's examples of um, standing operating procedures. There is an e-learning um, module um, to support clinicians in the use of technology to provide safe acute level care to patients. Um, there are two pathways that have been developed: acute respiratory infection and frailty virtual wards. I would mention this point. Those those aren't the two models that have been mandated. They just they're they're the two that have been created at the moment, um, just for use. Um, there's also there's the, been the introduction of a set of digital technology assessment um, criteria, and that's included standards to support interoperability um, and some guidance for um, will be issued quite soon around kind of selecting procuring technology platforms. Um, and there's there's also there's a whole load of guidance around um, information governance and data flows um, and managing that compliance. Um, as you can see on sorry, can we go back? Um, there's also there's additional guidance and documentation, and there all of these links are embedded within these slides. So the, for the three takeaways that I would say for this this talk are firstly that virtual wards 
both nationally and in, and within the southwest that are not new. Uh, they they have got proof of concept. Um, but tech enablement really does create an opportunity to try and improve the patient experience whilst extending and preserving hospital capacity. The second take home, I think, is that there is a national ambition that's been set and there is some dedicated resource to actually um, deliver that locally, um, which is ring fence specifically for um, virtual wards. And that's to the tune nationally of 450 million ring fenced over the next two years with a dedicated national programme team that's been set up. Um, and regional resources as well to support you. And the third thing is there is lots of published guidance that exists um, to help you in terms of both clinical and operational guidance um, to help with the management and the setup of these kind of models. Now I'm going to stop there. Um, I'm going to whiz to the end. We have got some contact details there. I'm happy to take any questions. And I also just wanted to out uh, one of our clinical leads, Matthew Dolman, who I believe is talking this afternoon, who is also in the audience. So if there are um, clinical questions, he may be able to support with those answers or you may be able to reach out to him during the course of today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sally. That's really uh, great to share that with us. I think absolutely a game changing opportunity there. So I'm going to open the floor and the audience here for questions for uh, Mark, for Craig or for Sally. Uh, quickly, for Mark, I mean, I'm very pleased you've done the wireframe from the monitor because when we work with our EPR providers, we tend to have a conversation, such a tiny whisper, and they go away and then rather than show you mock up, they come back six months later and they're done and they've coded it. And it's not right. And you think, oh, why didn't you just show us before you coded it? That happens a lot. And the other thing was, are you working with your EPR provider? Because, you know, the trouble is the EPR provider, they should be biting your hand off to get you to work with them because you know, they probably don't have that built in. If they built that in, every trust in the company would want to. But, you know, how do you approach them? I'm working with my digital team and my trust to try and solve those issues. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any more questions for, even for Andrew as well? Yeah? Question for Andrea, thank you. Um, same app I work with, I, I appreciate that you were completed, I haven't. I start with this patient safety also uh, in another trust, and uh, I'm just asking uh, the, the amount of work we did for uh, bringing all these people is great. I, I've been in the same situation. I would like to talk to you about it. But probably the functionality is different. Huh? It was an app. The develop for uh, to, to, to be used inside the hospital only, uh, so to ask the patients safety for certain questions and not in the profile and not buying uh, the nurses and the hospitals. So I would like to explore more about that with you so we can have some idea. Thank you. We do have, um, it doesn't interact with clinicians at the moment, that's something we'll look to explore further, but there's huge barriers in that when we just first looked at it. But there is um, the Hammersmith, um, they do have a helpline which they've allowed us to incorporate into the app, so if patients do have specific questions, they can contact Hammersmith. So that's been a brilliant kind of intermediate um, step at the moment. So, thank you. Are you happy if I answer that one in the chat? So I've, just, I've got so much interference, it's really difficult to hear. Yeah, that should be fine. Thank you. That's fine. Thank you. So thank you, everybody. So I just wanted to say a big round of applause and thank you to Andrea. Craig, Mark and Sally for sharing their insights and their journey so far. And, and just a final takeaway for me, I was asked um, top three traits that I'd look for, or I think they're important for innovators or pirates as we call them. I think the first one that we've heard from all the audience is resilience and per perseverance. Um, the, the way I kind of sum it up is kind of a fall seven times, but stand eight and look and recognize that you know it's going to take some endurance and setbacks but to unlock your full potential but use the data that you pick up from failing 
as you're learning and we apply that in. And the second piece I think is humility. I think it's really important to recognize that when you're bringing innovation into the NHS, a lot of people are fearful of change. Spend time, get to know those teams first, and there's nothing better than actually seeing your innovation being sort of promoted through those. And then the last one was, which I've come up with, well, is passion. I think, uh, you know, you need that passion and that drive to drive it forward. So being an innovator, I thought I'd go onto Google and I'd see what the AI come up with. Why do you need passion for innovation? And it says you need passion because it creates energy and enthusiasm to overcome the barriers and the hurdles that we put in place for your innovation activity. <laughs> Only passionate people will resist the narrowing of their scope, reducing of their expectations and accepting the status quo. So that's it for me. Thank you very much.